Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this National Arts Festival live webinar. This is the fifth in a series of webinars that we've been doing um, that have really been focusing on how to assist artists with this massive change that we've all had to undergo towards the online space. Um, it was a big shock for many of us um, as COVID came along and we had to all reassess and redesign our businesses. Um, and yeah, many of us have been left wondering how to do it all. So the National Arts Festival, having decided to go online ourselves, um, has also decided to assist by bringing together wonderful people um, to talk to us and to talk to you about uh, some of the ideas that are out there for allowing you to do your work in the online space in the best possible way. So today, um, I, I want to take you through a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, you are not visible um, and your microphone is mute. However, if you would like to ask a question, then please do type it into the Q&A section, which you'll find at the bottom of the page view. If the question is answered before we get to the Q&A section of the event, we will mark it as answered. But if we are going to be able to pass it on to the panel, then we shall do so during the webinar. Um, we do have a limited amount of time, so any questions that don't get answered during the course of this session um, will be answered in writing and we'll make sure that we get back to you. The webinar is being recorded and it will be made live, um, oh, sorry, available after the, after the session. But um, if you have some friends who want to join us and they haven't logged in and they haven't registered, they can in fact go to the webinar, um, sorry, to the National Arts Festival's webpage right now and they will also see a live stream of the event happening. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our panel. Um, we have a wonderful group of wonderful brains and, and ex experiences in the room with us today. Um, because marketing, you know, it's that kind of, it, it often comes for artists at the end of the line. Um, many of us are, are so busy making our work and thinking about what we're doing and immersing ourselves in the work. And then sort of at the end comes marketing when you've got to get eyeballs on your show. And it's quite a different relationship to the work. And so it, it requires a little bit of a, of a change of mindset. Um, and so today we're going to discuss that change of mindset, but also some practical techniques and tips that you could take with you in order to market your work online. So in our panel today, we have the fabulous Lebo Lion. Um, Lebo is, hi Lebo, she is the voice of marketing and uh, is a social media strategist. She's the co-founder of the digital marketing agency Beeple SA, and she has a fabulous podcast called Lebo Lion Loves Marketing, and we will post links to that so that you can follow and you can entertain yourselves during the traffic jams that you're going to be going into when we are all out of lockdown. But yeah, she's, she's a really fantastic voice on marketing in a South African context, so it's really great to have that. So Lebo, thank you very much for joining us today. We have Savannah Feek Fortune, who's a creative strategist. She's a connector and a catalyst of note, I must add. A street art aficionado, a Gen X entrepreneur. And she is the head of marketing and communication at Barca Business Art South Africa. Welcome today to Sean Duvay. Sean has a very long list of titles. In fact, we've had to really just come down to a few of them. But Sean is a South African entertainment entrepreneur and an investor. He's also a fabulous philanthropist. Um, he's the CEO of the and founder of The Unit, which is South Africa's leading entertainment-based holding company. And he's the CEO and founder of Anything Goes, which is a branded entertainment agency that brings us many events. Um, he's also the co-founder and director of the Ultra SA event, which brings about 50,000 dance music revelers to, to the country every year and some of the biggest names in music. So Sean certainly has experience with very large events. Thank you for being with us. We also have John, John Savage, who is a who started out his career with the globe trotting rock band cassette and then went on to become a 5FM DJ a musical director, a film director, the creator of the 5FM MASH Lab, and as well as AMPD Studio, which is a free culture hub for emerging artists based in Maboneng in Joburg. 
He's an award-winning content strategist and he runs In Broadcasting, a company that specializes in innovations around broadcasting and live streaming. He is also the proud founder of Busker, which I will let him chat to you a little bit about later, but it's a really exciting and innovative way of um, artists getting feedback and earning money, um, but I'll let him take you through that a bit later on. And then last, but very much not least, we have Ayanda Makai, who's a South African actor, musician, motivational speaker. He's also an ambassador of the UN Refugee Agency, and he is a co-creator of the sensational online Instavella, the show Lockdown Heights, which you can catch on Instagram. And again, we will put a link to that um, in, the, in the notes today. So thank you to each and every one of you for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. Um, and we don't have that much time, so I'd love to just jump right in if that's okay with you. So Sean, first off, you're behind some of South Africa's uh, biggest crowd pulling events. And um, obviously that space has changed somewhat. Um, but regardless, there's always this sort of um, nub to everything. What is that sort of secret of success? Do you want to share a little bit about what you think the secret sauce is when it comes to attracting people to your event or your show? Sure, Sasha, thank you very much for having me. It's lovely to be here. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, the, the art of bringing people together has kind of always been, I guess, what I've always been about throughout all my different clubs and festivals and events and, and you know, yeah, I guess what I've, what I've always been about. I guess, you know, the answer to the secret sauce is, you know, first thing that comes to mind if I tell you I'd have to kill you isn't that like, you know, <laughs> you know it's, uh, <laughs> um, it's a lot of love it's a lot of passion it's a lot of hope it's you know it's it's determination it's focus it's all the cliches that you can possibly think of at the end of the day you know for me I've been in the entertainment and the eventing industry for the past 20 years of my life and really I guess passion is the first starting point of where it all came from you know I started out as a bedroom DJ kind of elevated to like a club promoter from a club promoter, you know, created a marketing agency, found the, the link between, you know, uh, marketing and music, and then found the, the beautiful kind of gap in between, which was the liquor industry, the more specifically, you know, within that space and created the agency to focus very much on them and, and just built up and then started bringing big artists into the big music artists to, to, to tour the country, um, opened up a bunch of nightclubs and then moved on to music festivals. And yeah, today, you know, we've got Ultra South Africa, which is the biggest on the continent and um, the Corona Sunsets festivals as well. So I, I guess the secret sauce, yeah, is passion, it's love, it's focus, it's believing in yourself. You know, it's going to be a bumpy road. You know, up until now, it's interesting, you know, we, we had Ed Sheeran come out and, you um, he, um, we had him at Bridges for Music, which is, you know, one of the charities, which I'm a, a, a board, you know, on the board of. And I'll never forget this interview. And he said one thing which was just so profound is like, he's never had a plan B. You know, everyone asks this question, like, you know, what, what is your plan B? And, and it, it sat with me, you know, because I don't have a plan B. You know, it's always been about that. But now I'm starting to think like, what is the pivot, obviously, considering the times that we're in. Um, yeah, look, there's, uh, it's, it's challenging times, but I guess to answer your question, the secret source is just believing in yourself and, and, and pushing it and going forward. And I think that once, once you're comfortable with like who you are, you believe in yourself, you tick all those boxes, going out there and marketing your product to the world, you know, it's, it's, it's such a proud thing to do. And you've got to go there almost with like, you know, strategy, obviously being one, but you've got to go out there with like courage and determination and belief in yourself that this is the best version of yourself. This is the best product that you can possibly put out towards the market that you're talking to and just go guns blazing. I mean, that's been my approach and strategy and I've knocked my head many times. It hasn't always been right, but uh, in a nutshell, I think that that sums it up. I could talk for hours, but I know we're limited on time. I hope that that answers the question. No, it does. Thank you very much, Sean. Absolutely. That passion, that ability to just keep on going no matter what. And I think artists, I mean, I've been working with the National Arts Festival for some time and I've never seen such passion, really. Artists are phenomenal when it comes to passion and tenacity and grit. And I think you have it in bucket loads and it's really just digging deep now and finding it and, and putting it into a different space. It's the same yeah. stuff, but it's just in a different space. Absolutely. I think, you know, it's interesting. I did a webinar quite recently with um, 
with the entertainment sector more specifically and proverb was on there as well you know he's a, he's a great entertainer he's an artist he's done amazing things over the years and he also he said something which is quite profound to me and he said look from the music perspective like his uh, he, like his voice as an artist the question is he's saying as an artist what else are you thinking to go out there to you know to to get revenue what are your other like forms of revenue stream because from like the music perspective if it's not covid that's going to take you down if it's not lockdown if it's not it's relevance it's you know it's it's staying up to date with current trends look i guess from the music perspective it might be different from like you know the arts perspective but i guess kind of relevant or not you know so it's constantly staying up to speed with what's out there and you know again i think being confident in your craft and your art and you know from a marketing perspective we've all got the same tools in front of us right now we all at home with the laptop in front of us you know so don't be scared to educate yourself there's the beautiful digital online market marketing courses out there these amazing free webinars like this just believe in yourself and educate yourself and and craft your brand because that's who we all are we brands we're walking brands all of us at the end of the day you know yeah 100 thank you sean Pleasure. savannah you've uh, worked with artists and ideas and you've also worked with commercial brands so you've had a, a few different kinds of experiences of promoting work and people and ideas um, and how does an artist even start on their journey to market their work online if you haven't really been there yet or haven't been doing a lot there yet I mean, is there a formula to approaching this? Thank you, Sasha. Um, I have to first say that it's such a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. It's also such an honor to be surrounded by all of these fantastic marketers and um, to be able to share some of my insights with the creative sector. I'm really, really passionate about them. Um, and then to answer your question, I really thought about it and there's no exact formula but there's some tips and tricks. Um, I was chatting to artists because I thought I had a recipe and then they just threw me off. So, <laughs> so I'll get into it. So my original recipe is have a plan before digital marketing, have a plan for your business because like Sean said, you are a business and you are a brand. And I had such an interesting conversation with Mama Kashaka, Nandi Mrepo, and she asked me, what is your brand? What's your personal brand? You're so busy marketing everyone else. What do you represent? And I really had to think about that. And I came up with four things that I usually apply to strategic thinking. And that's have an overview. Have an overview about what you do, what you have to offer, um, your mission, your vision, business studies, EMS 101. <laughs> um, the next step is to have an objective what you want to accomplish, what's your personal bucket list for your career um, and the trajectory of your career. And then the third step is story making and storytelling. How do you tell an authentic story to you and your brand? And then there's sustainability. So I'll just unpack that a little bit. Um, when I was chatting to a few of these creatives, a big thing that came up was content is king. You have to take yourself seriously. You have to be professional. And that starts off with content. Um, if you are um, a, an artist or illustrator, take great pictures of your work. And there's so many fantastic apps right now. You can use your phone. Make sure that your work is aligned. You've upped the color. Um, with your copy, make sure it's really clean. And think about what platform on social media works for you because social media is a must right now. Um, that our world is going to. And you also need to think about what platform works for you um, and what, where your content can live. You can't be thinking about doing these long posts on Instagram, on Twitter, it's impossible. So do your research and think about that. Um, there's something else that came up that I think is really important and it's to be consistent. Be consistent with your work. Work with brands, but make sure that you know what you represent. What's the golden thread between all of your platforms, between all of your communications? What's your it factor? Um, and what separates you from everyone else? And I think it's about being yourself and true to your brand. And you'll touch on that when you do your overview. Um, 
the next thing I, so yeah, I'm looking at my notes. The next thing <laughs> I was thinking about was um, resources. There's so many resources available now and it's free. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I do head up the marketing and comms team for business in Arts of Africa. And we have a fantastic programs um, section that tackles really, really fantastic issues. Um, and they, they just equip you and get you business ready while not trying to turn you into a business. Um, when COVID entered our world, we also decided to make our art stack number eight abbreviated available to everyone as a free resource, which I'll share with you to share with everyone. And that informs how consumers engage with the arts and also how businesses sponsor the arts. It's very important to do your research and be well informed. Um, and then look for a mentor, look for someone that you really look up to, pop them a message, pop them an email, be professional and tell them I'd like to learn from you, but also think about what you are willing to offer and share with them. I think that's important. We can't just be thinking about what we can get and what people owe us. We also need to think about what we can share. Um, and my next point is Beyond. It's one of my favorite platforms to discover and share new work. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the platform, but have a look at it. It puts you on a global scale. And I think as marketers, when we report back on ROI, return on investment, and we think about those things, we need to factor in Beyond's and how many, like, what's the reach of that? Um, so yeah, that's my, my thoughts. That's amazing. Thanks, Savannah. That's really great That's advice. Important. I also particularly think it's important what you're saying about actually taking a step back before you start. So taking a, a step back and really looking at what do you want to say. Um, it's very easy to get caught up in the race and get caught up in the need to be there first and loudest and most. But actually, it's really that integrity at the, at the, at the center of your message that's so important. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Okay. Lebo. So, many artists um, that we're speaking to today have been significantly affected by what's happened um, to, with, with their work in COVID-19. Um, and, you know, it's, budgets are, are tight at the moment. So, I know that social media is one of the ways that we can really effectively reach audiences um, and not with too much budget. And um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how people can really do a good job of social media in, with, with a small budget. Uh, thank you for having me, Sasha, and hello to everybody. Um, there are a million ways that I could answer that question. It's so tempting for me to go on for hours, uh, but because we've got limited time, I'm gonna try and make it as short and as concise as possible. So I just wanna contextualize the, the social media space before I get into my answer. There are over 3 billion social media users in the world. So that means that if you've got a social media account, you have access to 2.9999 billion people globally. So what does that mean for you as an artist? It means that you've got access to over 2.99 billion uh, audience with customers, uh, stakeholders, possible investors, possible brands. You've got access to all of those people and you don't have to have a manager to talk to those people. It's just between you and that audience, you and that stakeholder. So it's direct access to those people, which is why social media is such a powerful tool for artists anywhere in the world because they get to control their own narrative and actually have a, you know, a say in how things work for them and how they do business online and how they speak to their audience, which is very important. So the key things that people use social media for are to either entertain, to educate, or to inspire. And I think that before anyone in the entertainment industry or who's an artist decides to use social media, they have to decide what they're going to use that social media for. So, or why they're going to plan that event. Are they going to plan the event or host an event to inspire people, to educate people, or to entertain people? Once they've answered that, they can then go into the strategies that they can use to get audience members and to reach people. And I think the most powerful thing about social media is that it gives you access to audiences and it lets you reach people in ways that you would never be able to on the ground. So for example, I know a lot of artists rely on concert tours, you know, to make their money. And 
the average concert might have, if it's a big concert, because I don't actually know the numbers for concerts, but if it's a huge concert, it might have 30,000 people attending the concert, right? But with social media, you can have a million people attending your concert and they don't even have to leave their homes. So you've got access to more people and that's what you want as an artist. You want more people to hear you, to listen to you, to consume your content so that you can get more streams, uh, more eyes and possibly more sales. And I think during this time of COVID-19 and lockdown, the two main strategies that I would use when using social media as an artist is collaboration and uh, leveraging on virality. So I'm just gonna go into collaboration first. Collaboration is so important when you're using social media as an artist because your main objective is to reach people. And by collaborating, you can reach people who you don't necessarily reach on your own. And so I would say that, for instance, if you're a hip hop artist, collaborate with communities that have hip hop listeners, you know, or that um, share some kind of hip hop culture content, because you're accessing people who might not know you, people who might be interested in what you're doing. And so you get to leverage off of that. And also when you communicate, collaborate with um, other communities, you get to share the cost of resources. So if you want to host an event, you can both share the cost of it and it becomes cheaper to host the event. And you also get to share skills and, and knowledge. So you might be an artist who's very good at uh, creating songs, but they might be a community that's very good at hosting really incredible webinars. So you can use your collective talents to create really amazing online assets. So collaboration is key. And another reason why collaboration is so important is because it also lets eyes see you that would not necessarily have seen you so for example if you're an artist and you're in a community that talks about hip-hop uh, the person who's in the crowd might be working at YFM for example and they, they might hear your music and say actually we'd love to stream your songs on YFM we'd love to interview you and those are opportunities to grow and to be seen because as an artist you want to use social media to be visible you want to use social media as a customer acquisition tool and also Another great thing about collaboration, especially collaborating with communities, is that you find that a lot of brands, when they're online, they, they check communities, they check for talent in communities, they check for what's trending in communities. And I always say to people that um, money likes to go where attention goes. So brands will go where people are giving their most attention. And that's usually the easiest source of that is community. So I'd say when you collaborate, you get brands to see you because there's so much attention on those spaces that they end up engaging with the content that's there because they believe that the people are enjoying that content and consuming it because they think it's valuable. And so they start to think that you are valuable. And so that's why it's important to collaborate. And also, I mean, you've got really amazing tools like Facebook Market, Facebook Lives, IG Lives, where you can stream concerts, for example. And what a lot of artists have been doing is they've been, um, they've got these plugins where they ask people to give them tips or just donate something for the concerts that they host. So it allows you to monetize, you know, your talent whilst you're at home and you can't um, have concerts. And another thing that a lot of artists are doing is they're selling merchandise as they perform. So they'll have really cool pop-up ads as they're performing on Facebook Live or IG Live and they're selling merchandise, t-shirts, caps, you know, apparel, whatever they can sell, they're selling it, you know? And I think that really works for a lot of musicians in terms of staying relevant, in terms of, in terms of uh, creating an extra source of income and just, you know, knowing how to navigate through this, this environment as it is right now with COVID and lockdown. And then in terms of virality, I think, a lot of artists are missing out on the gem that is vi virality, especially on platforms like Twitter and uh, TikTok. You know, so uh, it's very cool when artists just jump onto uh, hashtags because on hashtags, you've literally got so many eyes, so much attention on those hashtags. And there's a higher likelihood that whatever you produce, so whether it's a song or a video, or whatever it may be, that it will get more eyes automatically just because it's under that hashtag. So for me, I would really leverage off of hashtags. A lot of people are at home right now. They're bored. They don't know what to do. And when they don't know what content to consume, they usually go for the viral content, the content with the hashtags. So I'd say leverage off of the hashtags 
because they'll get your, your uh, content to be seen by a lot more people. And then in terms of TikTok, TikTok is great because a lot of artists have actually become big artists because of TikTok. So artists like Doja Cat, for example, they became famous and they got a lot of streams on other DSPs just from creating content and music for TikTok. So I would say that a lot of artists should try get on the TikTok bandwagon, uh, jump onto the, the hashtags and the trends on, on TikTok, and also just um, collaborate with other musicians on TikTok so that, you know, even if you're not using your own song, that you're being seen by people so they know that you're a musician who exists and if they enjoy the content enough they'll go and check out your own content on your page so that's what i talk about that's what i would do if i was a musician i would leverage off of uh, virality and collaborations thank you i mean i also have noticed that some of the most successful things happening on social media by artists is in fact not necessarily them doing a show but perhaps them letting you into their lives a little bit so it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that you have to go and do your show and put it on Facebook. In fact, for some that might not be strategically a great move, but mm -hmm. actually say, okay, well, this is where I live and this is what I do and this is how I hang out and this is my dog and those kinds of things that actually just build your personal brand a little bit. So it's a great opportunity to do that too. Yeah, there's Definitely. someone on TikTok who literally sleeps and people watch him sleep. That's the level of, <laughs> of amazing <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Lebo. That's really valuable insights. I really appreciate it. Okay, and now I'm going to turn to you, Ayanda. Um, you've been like making lemonade out of lemons this particular lockdown. Um, so Lockdown Heights has had like the most insane media coverage. Um, we're going to show you a clip just now. Ayanda's going to say hello. He's going to explain a little bit about Lockdown Heights first. Um, but yeah, it's an extraordinary phenomenon and um, congratulations to you for that. Um, so yeah, they've been on BBC, they've been on all the South African media and, um, and it's really an example that I'd, I'd like to share with you of how one can actually do extraordinary things um, out of a crisis. So Ayanda, over to you. Um, thank you, Sasha, and uh, hi to everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really honoured to be amongst such great minds, first and foremost. Um, I think let's just go straight to the snippet, just so everyone gets uh, an idea of what Lockdown Heights is, and then I will unpack it from the outside. Thanks. Lockdown Heights is a Lockdown Heights Listen, I know that you and Brittany have a history and it's behind us now. And I know that you guys share a friendship and you have a really good friendship and I respect that. Which is why I wanted you here. <sighs> Baby, I know I couldn't have most of your friends and your family tonight, but I just couldn't wait. Um, were you... Brittany? Will you marry me? Um... <laughs> Um, what you've just seen right there is a snippet um, from what we call the world's first Instavella, which is a telenovela that's created and hosted on Instagram. Um, and what this is basically is it's riveting stories, you know, where the drama still continues, the, the love affairs, the murder mysteries, and everything continues. Um, but it's shot by actors in the individual homes. 
um, all three of those people that were in the scene were in separate environments. Every actor that was there was in their own environment, and we put it together and edited it together so it comes across like in the same space. Um, so yeah, that's exactly what it is. You know, it's a matter of finding innovation. Uh, what we wanted to do was to pioneer a different way of storytelling, and I think now is the time to trial and error, you know, and to do whatever your heart and your mind and your creativity pushes you to do. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. Really, really mm. well done. Thank you. And I absolutely agree. I mean, I think it's 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 a moment where I know that the, the trajectory of people's emotions around what has happened with COVID-19 has had to take effect. You know, people have had to realize what they are losing and what they are grieving. But by the same token, there is extraordinary opportunity here. Um, and if you're prepared to see it, and if you're perhaps prepared to look at doing things differently, um, yeah. because that's, that's kind of what it takes. I mean, you know, this isn't something you would necessarily ordinarily have done, but um, you, or you might have made it, but you wouldn't have made it in separate places. But the situation has forced you to do that. And actually, it's made it really special. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, <laughs> there's a quote I like to refer to by Condolozzi Rice that says, every person who is the first in something, they set up to be something they love. You know, and that's what happened here. Yeah. And in essence, what we did was we decided that our passion for, for, for the craft and acting um, cannot die because of a pandemic, you know, and we all cannot be on hold because of the pandemic. So we came together as actors and decided let's find something where we will allow um, the craft to, you know, to, to, to nurture itself. And so within that and just focusing on that, this lockdown heights idea kind of created itself. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will also post the links to that um, after the show so that you can um, see what it's all about yourselves. You can follow along. So, John, turning to you, um, it's a defining moment, I think, for how we attach value to online work. Um, so talk to us about the perception, because there is a perception that kind of has grown up around the online space that online equals free. Um, and we've seen how damaging that's been to the media industry, for instance. Um, and I'd, I'd like to get your views on, on what you think we can do as a community to prevent that from happening to the arts and entertainment industry. Cool. And I just want to reiterate as well, I'm really honored to be in the company of everyone. I'm such a fan of what everyone is doing. Um, Ayanda, that is phenomenal, that project you're working on there. And I'm super jealous that I didn't come up with it. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, what, what I'm really excited about um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the social media is a very, very full place, very, very cluttered. And, um, you know, as Lebo was saying, this, the whole world is on the thing. So, you know, the way to stand out is different. And I think what has happened over this time that has been exciting is that all the rules are, are gone. So it, it's a huge opportunity to break all the rules. It's why there's so much innovative stuff like what Ayanda is doing. And there is a super opportunity because, um, you know, I think historically online has always been an afterthought and it's been forced into being the focus of what we're doing. And suddenly the slow adoption um, has had to catch up. So we've had five years of, of sort of digital um, adoption happening overnight. Um, and that's very scary, very daunting. And if you're an artist, like you don't even know where to start, that's really problematic. The reality is, and it's kind of where Busker came from, is that it's very hard to change culture. And culturally, millennials see the internet as free. I think, you know, personally, um, what I saw happening very quickly, and, and is also what kind of inspired Busker, is that the ticketing idea doesn't really work online in a in a long in a in a sort of a way that's going to evolve in the future i think partially you know it it came in very quickly because people were trying to monetize but going to a concert is not the same as going to a live stream and um you know you it doesn't have that audience engagement and it's not the same thing and also if you do three gigs in a row it's not like three different venues three different countries it's one gig so it sort of changes how you have to approach 
your digital um, um, sort of performance because your performance has to be unique, each one of them. They have to be gold. They have to be authentic. And so it, the relationship between you and the person watching you has changed. And that's just a fact. You can see it, how we're having to engage with each other, even with this meeting over how this works. And we're getting used to the protocols and we're creating new learnings. And having a webinar in a real room doesn't work the same way that it happens in this room. So with that, I think there's lots of opportunity. So with Busker, and, and what Busker is, is um, it's a tool we built that um, allows people to monetize their art in real time. Um, what it happens is like a little widget that you put on your screen, and while you are performing, people can contribute to you in real time what they think your performance is worth. And it's not the same as offering your, your um, art for free, and also there is a space for free. Um, I think there's a space for all of these types of things. What you see happening in the online space is artists have to gain traction and gain trust. And that's, that's often with the output of a lot of free stuff. But as soon as you move into the ticketing environment or into the busker environment, you are saying to the audience, this is worth something now. And whether you're saying it's worth 50 Rand or you're saying you decide how much this is worth, it's the same thing. It's not a deval devaluation. I think it's a valuation. And what's better about it is that when you set your ticket price at 50 bucks, you've valued your art at 50 bucks. What Busker has enabled us to do is to see what people really value in the moment. Plus, the contributions that happen through Busker happen at the time that there's an emotional connection with the performance. So when it's, you know, on a cast and singing Blue Eyes, it's during that chorus. Or it's when a comedian actually makes a mistake and tries to recover. It's those emotional moments that actually get people riled up and, and uh, get people um, incentivized to give you a contribution. And sometimes when you make a mistake on air, that's when you get your biggest contributions. So it's psychologically transforming how you're engaging with your audience because they are not only judging you like they would in a real space, they're judging you with their wallets. Um, and some people, you know, some people are making a great living off busker. Some people are earning, uh, you know, one contribution can be a thousand rand. We've, we've found that often, most often, the contribution amounts are higher than a ticket price. And so that's been really interesting. Um, and then some people haven't quite figured out yet that the relationship with the audience has changed. And that's where it's, it's kind of a new territory. It's, it's a new art form and we're learning it. We're very lucky because we sit at the top and see all these thousands of busking streams happen all day. Some fail, some don't, some are great, some guys are learning stuff. And what we're learning is the audiences are also learning to be an audience in the space. It's not just the artists who have that struggle. Um, and I do think, sorry, I'm just, you know, a lot, a lot is coming to mind. <laughs> you know, this idea of authenticity, I think it is, um, what I'm seeing is the, the guys who are most authentic. You know, if I just take a step back, in traditional media world, everything has to be perfect. The lighting has to be perfect. The, the background has to be perfect. And those people who have moved into this new situation trying to duplicate that, it doesn't work. People know you're locked at home, so don't pretend you're not. People know the limitations that are on you, so don't pretend that you're not. They sympathize emotionally with you being really true about, the, you know, this mic is broken, I'm really sorry. That actually evokes sympathy and can help you uh, with your connection with your audience. My mic isn't broken, but I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> and, and it's that kind of relationship that, that artists are building through Busker. Um, the other thing that happens with Busker is just that you also send a message with your contribution. So not only are you saying, here's a hundred rand and listen, um, Sashi doing a great job. Sasha gets that message and says, oh, John just gave me a hundred. John, thank you so much for that contribution. And that spurs on other contributions. And it, it's anyone who's tried crowdfunding understands the psychology of crowdfunding is that you never talk about money. You never ask for money. That's how you don't get money. But once you are thanking people for their contribution in a fun way, it inspires a lot more contributions. So it, it's very um, an interesting new thing. I don't have all the answers and I'm just spewing it all out because it's new information that we're doing. And I think it is really important for all performers. It's important to have a content strategy. It's important to be authentic. Um, and it's important to listen. So if your social media isn't growing, you're doing something wrong. If you're not getting contributions through Busker, you're doing something wrong. And when you do something that actually gets a little peak, look back at it and sort of become a little data scientist and go, what did I do that got that little peak? What did that thing do that I work? Now I'm going to do more of that. 
do they like dogs or do they like cats? Oh, they don't like dogs. They like cats. So I'm going to do more cats. And if you keep looking at your stuff while you're doing that, then you build the roadmap for what is the new normal, the new future, your new digital sort of um, uh, roadmap to success. Absolutely. I'm very heartened to hear that um, contributions, and that's what they are, are, are so high and that are, are so free flowing. It's really um, I mean, I've also anecdotally been speaking to artists who say that they're doing very well with their online shows. It's, it's been quite surprising to many people how well. Can I add one thing? Sorry. You know, sure. anyone who's done crowdfunding, you will unlock a secret that the corporate world doesn't know or doesn't understand. People want to be a part of what you're doing. They want you to succeed. And if you've ever done a crowdfunding project, you'll be really surprised how generous people are and you don't know why they are. And then you have to really put yourself in the other side. Uh, people, you know, luckily the people in this room are artists. If you're not an artist, you're desperate to be closer to the art. So when you open up the uh, ability to participate in what you're doing, it really is a different mindset. Um, you know, I, when I made my feature film a few, uh, four or five years ago, we raised like about a million rand doing that. And I was like, why are people giving me money to make this film? Because they wanted to see the film get made. They, they didn't want something in return. They didn't want equity. And so that's really the philosophy we put into Busker. When you watch your favorite artists perform on the live stream for home, you know the pain they're going through. You know what they're worth. You're there for a reason. You're watching them. So you want them to, you want to contribute to them. Um, and that's just been a, a really like beautiful new way to look at the artist and audience relationship. Yeah. I mean, I think it's something that, that has happened live at the National Arts Festival every year. It's exactly that same intention that comes with people towards as they arrive in Makanda and settle in and meet for the first glass of Glühwein, it's, <laughs> it's that need to support, to be part of, to be, you know, so it is literally taking that into an online space, that very thing at the essence of it all. So thank you, John, for bringing that, that up as well. So I think we should probably move to questions now. Um, our first question today is from Mohammed. He asks, and this is to anyone on the panel who'd care to answer, um, is cause marketing a good marketing strategy for a theater company? Would anyone like to give some thoughts on that? Can we just explain cause marketing maybe for me? Okay. So I, my take on that is that um, it would be around issues. It would be around... Oh. Um, you know, say it's about water shortages, say it's about scarcity, say it's about. Okay, uh, if, if I have an opinion, if, if I can go for one. Yeah. The answer to that question, in my opinion, you know, is no one else can answer that for you. When you go into that marketing funnel, it is really important, uh, two things. One, understanding the audience that you're reaching, and B, is is what you are saying true to who you are? So if the question is, should I just get involved in cause marketing because it will help my business? The answer is no. If the cause that you are, um, you are looking at utilizing is absolutely central to who your business is and what you, are, what you stand for, and it's something you truly want to follow through with and assist, and it's central to why your business exists, then the answer to that is yes, then that makes perfect sense. But I, I do understand we're at this kind of confused space about where to start and how to, how to sort of stand out in the message. And the answer to me is always the truer you are to yourself, to who your business, to what your business stands for. That's what cuts through the clutter. It's all the people trying different things that sort of get lost by the wayside. And the guys who come up the middle are the guys who are really true and honest about where they're going, what they're, and what they're saying. Nice. Thank you. I, I think that's um, great. Um, just to add on what John is saying, um, I think also it's very important to know that if you're going to take the cause the, the cause marketing route, then um, it, it needs to be an anchor of your product. It needs to be the cause itself needs to be as authentic to the product as it um, as possible. Because if that if if that is not the anchor of the product, if that is not the purpose or the message that the brand is carrying, then the audience will not relate to it and will find it very fake. Um, so it, it has, it's very imperative that it becomes the anchor of your brand or the message you take across. That's good. 
Okay, Never. can I just add to that as well quickly? Um, I think cause marketing can actually be very tricky because people automatically assume that just because I am talking about a good cause, people will relate. And if it's such a good cause, they'll just automatically want to invest or consume or whatever the case may be. But I don't think a lot of people, when they use cause marketing, that they think about the value proposition. So they don't ask themselves, why should a person care about this cause? And I think that's what's missing in that marketing and in the messaging. It's not necessarily about the cause, but about why people should care about the cause that can make your cause marketing successful or not mm -hmm. successful. So yeah, don't just think that because people, you know, are good at heart that they'll care about, you know, global warming. They won't. Why should they care about global warming? I think that's the difference between good cause marketing and bad cause marketing. Thank you. Great answer. Um, if I can just add, I think as marketers, we know this all too well. When you do cause marketing, are you doing it for an award or are you doing it for the cause? Because we have lots of incentives, lots of awards going around. And sometimes the consumer or the audience can see right through it that look, this marketing is actually to gain lots of reach and get lots of attention, but it's not actually for the cause, for the people, for the objective. So I think especially now in the time of COVID-19, you need to make sure that your objective is crystal clear. <laughs> Okay. Not only good for your brand, but good for society. Thanks, Savannah. I think we got the gist of it. Sean, yes. Sean, sorry, just a second. We're going to unmute you now. Could someone unmute Sean, please? Unmute myself. There we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a great one. I just like listening to what everyone's saying. And, and I agree with, with, with everyone. You know, it's a combination. And I think like we've got like a bit of a case study you know, recently, you know, as soon as COVID hit, we realized with the entertainment industry how badly hit all of the kind of like hourly paid workers were and, you know, how the rug was completely taken un under from them, you know. So we created an NPO called the South African Fund for Entertainment. And, you know, the kind of in the, the plan of this fund was to create, you know, to create fund initiatives to make money to support, you know, these most affected within the entertainment industry, you know. From that, we created a stream, an online entertainment stream, which was the Dream Stream, and we landed up raising, I think, six hundred and fifty thousand rand via that that digital streaming festival. You know, and I guess to John's point, which is quite interesting, there it wasn't a ticketed show; it was a donation and contribution, you know, kind of show. And I guess you know, if I had to take like kind of the amount of people that donated and like find the common average, it's quite interesting because then I'd get to that ticket price if I had to actually have to ticket that event. But going back to the, you know, the point of that cause marketing, which Savannah also touched on, you know, what is the intention of your cause marketing strategy? What is, do you want exposure? Do you want to facilitate uh, something? Do you want to help an industry? Do you want to give back? Because if it, like from this case study, you know, by wanting to go out there and help the entertainment industry and by going out there and giving a product online, and letting people know that this is to help that, this is, this is for that cause, it digs into that emotion and people did contribute, you know, and they, you know, so I guess, yeah, I guess you've got to be true to yourself, you know, if, if you're doing it for the, if you're trying to chase the money, it's going to run away from you, you know, so what is, what is the end goal of your cause marketing, I guess, you know, because people are out there, they are listening and they will support if it's real and true, I believe. Yeah, 100%. Thank you very much. Um, our next question comes from an anonymous um, person who wants to know, who has pointed out that the, the festival is happening in less than a month and is saying, you know, is it not too late to, to start marketing? So just my comment on that is obviously everything has happened on the craziest timeline for everyone in the last little while. Uh, time has stretched and condensed and done all sorts of weird things. Um, so we kind of are dealing with what we're dealing with. But um, I know that online is a very immediate space. So is it too late? I don't think so. Does anyone have any contributions to that? Lebo? Unmute Lebo, please. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> um, I actually, I don't think that it's too late. And the reason why I don't think it's too late is because people are at home, they're looking for content to consume. So they're online more than they would have usually been if they were going to work every day or performing their regular tasks. So the way that you win on social media is through repetition, you know, and nobody can dictate how many times you can repeat your message in a day. And so instead of, you know, marketing your poster or use, showing your poster once a day, you could show it 20 times a day to different audiences. You could show it 20 times a day in different ways. You could show it a hundred times a day in, in different ways. And so the consumer in their minds, they see it so often that they start to gain some kind of interest and curiosity about what you're selling and then they'll engage or click on the on the poster or whatever it may be and then they'll start to ask questions and hopefully uh, join your event so I don't think it's too late I think a month is actually quite a long time especially if you're using repetition in your strategy and creating really like eye-catching uh, content that makes people want to engage in it absolutely thank you I'm going to go to Yayanda and then I'm going to go to John I saw you John can you unmute just, There we go. Just to, I mean, Lemu had touched on it previously, you know, the power of collaboration. Um, and I think that in itself has kind of like impacted how um, Lockdown Heights was able to get um, the, the amount of recognition it has over a short period of time, you know. Um, it was not even a month actually before we were on radio stations and TV interviews. But that was because of the power of collaboration because the community now is bigger that we are reaching. We're reaching more than the one community Ayanda would have reached. Uh, we now have, you know, different a um, actors on board who have average of about 10,000 to 90,000 followers each, you know? And so that in itself grows further and further. And, and so I think, no, the month in itself, the time period, I wouldn't say there is a definite time period. I think it is all dependent on your work ethic, your repetition, your work ethic, and your collaboration um, possibilities. Yes, John. Cool. I mean, uh, I don't think a month is, I think a month is a long time. And the reason is that, again, all the rules are changed. The reason you promote an, an event so long in advance, people have to book tickets. They've got to get there. There's other things that you're competing with. But essentially, you're competing with what's on Netflix tonight. And you don't book a month in advance to watch a Netflix program. So you're competing in a completely immediate space. And for me, the marketing um, thinking needs to change into that environment. And, and how you, those events sort of unroll on the week before and on the day is, is how you're going to make that impact. It's very hard for someone to commit to something now to watch a live stream of something in a month or three weeks or two weeks time. Yes, they want to know what it is. But in the moment, you're competing with the other things that are happening on the moment because of the immediacy of it. So I think it takes a rethinking or reshaping of the marketing model in that space, way more competitive, way more hardcore, but really fun because it's a new space. And spend this time maybe in the next week or so starting to build those collaborations that Ayanda spoke of and starting to reach out to people on social media and say, hey, you know, I'm going to be doing this thing. Join us, join my group, whatever it may be, and, and start, start the ball rolling in that way, certainly. Okay. Definitely. John, I have another question that's been directed at you. Um, it's from Khaba Lahora. And, the answer is no. And it, sorry? Nothing. Sorry, Kara. <laughs> it says, would you say there's a growing appetite now from brands for audio content? In other words, podcasts, like, like podcasts, since there's restriction on gatherings at the moment. So I would say not just for brands, because that, that does say brands in the question, but brands being also artists. Podcasts and audio content are massive. Weirdly, I, was, I spent an hour on the phone call with Spotify yesterday, and they were sharing with me the trends of what's going on throughout the whole content. I mean, we, again, this is such an exciting space for content creators because um, a lot of us have been spouting the stuff for years and years and years. Podcasts are coming, digital streaming, la, 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 la. It is so here right now. It is moving at such an exponential sp speed. We're, you're almost late to the... Um, to the party if you're starting to look at podcasts now. The monetization of podcasts is becoming real. South Africa has been super late to the party about that now. But according to Spotify, the numbers are really looking healthy. And there's a, a very careful, I mean, I'm not, I don't work for Spotify, but I would tell people to go 
and start doing this stuff on Spotify because Spotify is starting to bring in things that are going to bring your uh, African content to the whole world because they're seeing the trends, not only the demand internationally for, for content from here, but how easy it is to get something to trend on Spotify. So yes, uh, massive, massively. I mean, we run a business building radio stations for brands as well. That's picking up tremendously. Um, it, it's really an exciting place to get into the podcasting world. Super easy, super cheap. Um, just make great stuff, easy to put out. Um, and brands are also now uh, really looking at that space because they have to. Um, all brands who have been scared to really, really embrace the digital space are busy are looking at their budgets and figuring out how to get their foot in the door. So if you are the door, then it's good for you. And uh, Lebo, you are already in the space, so well done to you. <laughs> I also have a question for you, but go ahead and give your point, please. Um, just to add on to what John is saying, I think the podcast market in Africa is very tricky because it all depends on who your audience is. You know, and a lot of brands tend to favor a certain type of audience that, to, to other audience members. So, for example, on my podcast, I have a lot of people from the African continent who listen to it. Most of them are African people. Uh, most of them uh, are in corporate and et cetera, et cetera. So they've got, they've got a very specific kind of um, a makeup. And a lot of brands aren't finding that attractive for what they're trying to achieve. And they're saying, but this is not what we're used to being told about um, the African podcast listener. They perceive it to be somebody else. So I think it depends on who your audience is. And when you understand who your audience is, you can understand what kind of brands would want to collaborate with you on an audio project. And I've also found that with audiences or podcasts that have majority, you know, African listeners, and by African, I mean people with my, who look like me, um, they're really enjoying uh, video podcasts. Okay. So people who record themselves recording their podcasts and they put it on um, YouTube or IG Live or Facebook or something like that. A lot of brands are finding value in that because video content is so hot. Video content is everything for me. I think video always trumps audio right now. And I think for the next 10 years in, in Africa, video content is going to trump audio content. So I think if you are going to produce audio content, make sure that you have a, a visual or video element or aspect to it. Thank you, Lebo. Just stay with me for a second because I've got another question from Khaba. Um, in terms of influencers, since gatherings are restricted, how would you suggest they can keep producing their own content now since they really used to be in the same spaces as video videographers and photographers? Well, sorry, sorry, they can't be in the same spaces as videographers and photographers anymore. Um, and how do you basically still keep the level of quality? In other words, I think what this question is sort of speaking to is that you, your ability to find new content is quite um, limited in, in the current context. The ability to, sorry, I didn't hear you. Create new content as an oh, influencer. Um, I think it was John who was saying that the audience understands the current environment. So they want you to be as authentic as possible. You know, nobody's expecting Netflix quality content from your home. They just want to engage with whatever you have to offer them. So if you're good at singing and you want to post that, you know, using your phone, recording it with your phone, that's perfectly okay. Just be honest with your audience and be authentic and show them what you can do and the resources that you have at your disposal. I don't think anybody's expecting anyone online to have, you know, like Netflix quality content or anything like that. I think people are just really looking for content that they can relate to, that they can engage with, and that's consistent. And if you offer them that, then they'll stick to your page and they'll engage with you. Oh, thank you. That's, that's great advice. I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that we need to finish soon, but I've got a really great question that I'd like to pose to everyone because anyone on the floor could answer this and, and maybe a few of you would like to add to it. But the question is from David Muller and it is, do you have any tips for the older generation around marketing, those who are not used to social media? Uh, who's, who's going to take, should I, should I start? <laughs> Go for it, Lebo. Thank you. Um, I would say don't be afraid of the space. Um, 
you'd be surprised, but there are quite a lot of older people on social media who are using it to do a lot of things. So um, it's not just a space that's reserved for young people. <laughs> social media is for everybody and everybody has their space on social media. What I found is that for the older crowd, Facebook is a really great starting point in terms of learning how to use social media, engaging with people that they already know and engaging in communities that share content in a way that they can appreciate. So I found that Facebook is really good for that. But also, you know, don't be afraid to experiment. Social media is all about finding what works for you. You know, so it, it, there aren't any rules to social media. You just kind of do it the way you feel. You figure it out for yourself and you make it work the way you want it to work. So the power's in your hands. And another thing that I found with uh, all the social media users is that they don't really leverage off of that power that social media gives you to create your own narrative and define who you are because of you know the generation that they grew up in and, and how they see the world and exist in the world. So I'd say really consider creating your own narrative. Um, you know, branding yourself. Uh, I think that's the best way I can put it, you know, uh, whatever your outer ego may be, whoever you want to be, whatever you want to share with the world, social media is the best tool that you can use uh, to do that. So I'd say don't be afraid, experiment. Um, yeah, and, and engage and connect with people. That's great. Thank you. Um, John, I believe you'd like to say something and then I'm going to come to you, Ayanda. Okay, so this is my advice for anyone and I think it is probably the best kept secret of the internet and that is there are so many people there are online in the social media space that what works is not broad stuff you know when you think of all of those billions of people that you need to reach it's very daunting where do you start how do I be myself one of the golden rules to working on social media is niche is finding a really specific niche and the more niche you find the bigger your audience and if you think if you're a 66 year old man worried about social media what you can be sure of is there are a lot of other 66 year old men who have the same fear that you have so if you were to start something that was to address that or for them you know the, and the more sub niche your niches are the more the community is you can start I mean I've got a friend who just does a whole Instagram account doing paper shape what do you call it paper origami origami it's like got 150,000 um, people on it because that is a niche of a niche of a niche of a niche and I think when finding your lane think about what really directly affects you personally and when you start your talking you talk in that conversation to those people and you'll find your tribe and your tribe might be other 66 year old men interested in World War two books and origami and if it's just that niche you still might have 150,000 people in the world who you can talk to and so that's where that authenticity thing comes in and it's scary to try and go out there but the more you laser focus your or like what it is you're about the better it is for you thank you great advice Kayanda oh, definitely um, I, th I think another advice is also do not be scared to push the boundary because you think certain activities are out of your age range um you know you find that i was funny enough i think last week i saw this rapping duo from the uk and they're probably in their 80s you know um but they're trending and they're huge um but that's probably something they enjoyed doing by themselves at home and eventually came out and did it on social media um and so that's the thing don't i, I think do not um reserve yourself or hold back because you think the world is going to say this is not something an eight-year-old should be doing or a six-year-old should be doing. I think just go out there and push the envelope. Yeah, no, that's absolutely great advice. I love it. Okay, so we are really running out of time. So what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, panel, is just go around quickly and just give you a chance, each of you, to, to just leave us with a parting thought. Um, I'm going to start with you, Sean. Just a second. There we go. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sasha. I think yeah, this has been inspirational, guys. Firstly, thank you so much for having me and just everybody who's on this panel has been incredible. The insight from everybody has been just amazing. And I think, you know, kind of as a, as a closing thought is, you know, and, and it's relative to the last question, just don't be scared, you know, go out there. Everybody is listening. Educate yourself. Put your best foot forward and, you know, just go forth and conquer, you know, like at the end of the day, if you make a mistake, 
you know, it's okay, you know, get up and go for it. You know, if you're 66 years old, wanting to get into social media, don't be scared, go out there and do it. If you're doing a live interview and your microphone's broken, it's okay. People are forgiving, you know? So I think there's, there's been great insights. I really appreciate it. And, and I'd like to invest in Busco. So John, <laughs> let me, know. <laughs> let me wow. know if you're looking for investments. I'm in. <laughs> I like the model. It sounds great. <laughs> it happened here. It happened here. <laughs> um, thanks very much, Sean. It's been absolutely wonderful having you with us. And I really appreciate your time and, and energy. Um, I'm going to move on to Savannah. Savannah, um, any thoughts? Um, from my side, I think, as Sean mentioned, stay true to who you are. There's, so I'm from Cape, La Cape Town. Um, the southern suburbs, which is part of the Cape Flats, and there's a saying that we say, and it's done fast, and that means stay strong, stay down, stay true to who you are, stay focused. Um, I just have to touch on one of the questions I saw, when I can't leave this live without answering it. Someone told me that they have left, they were part of our um, hatred campaign, and they don't feel like they are part of the cool kids or influential because they don't have more than a thousand followers. Guess what? That model is changing. People don't just look to macro followers, they look for micro followers. And you are influential. Um, you just need to be consistent with your messaging and get yourself out there. So that's my parting thoughts. That's very beautiful advice. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, Lebo, would you like to give us a couple of thoughts in, in closing? Uh, okie dokie. Um, for me, it would just be about how we perceive social media, you know? Social media is all about building communities because your community is the one that's going to help you achieve your objectives. They're the ones that are going to make you look like the celebrity that you want to be or they're going to push your content wherever you need to be pushed. So social media is all about building a community instead of getting followers. And if you're concerned with community building, you'll understand why a thousand followers is just as valuable as a hundred thousand followers because it's all about the quality of the people who follow you than the quantity of the people who follow you and if we can all approach social media that way i think we can do so much more with it and have so much more fun when we're using social media and just to also tie in that uh, phrase that i always use which is money goes where attention goes and your community is the one that gives you the attention that you need for money to flow into whatever you create so always always think about work on nurture your community that's what's going to help you win on social media and on the ground thank you Levo. great great advice ayanda Yes. Um, from my side, I think the most important thing is for whoever's out there, all the artists who are out there and everyone who's part of this webinar, to know that you are a brand. Whether you're an artist, whether you are a, um, a theatre group, whether you're putting on a play, whether you're a musician, you're a brand, right? And therefore that brand needs to stand for something. The, the medium you are using, the tool you're using to communicate that is simply just the communication device. Therefore, that communication device needs to carry that. Find your universal language. That's what's going to get your, your, your story as close as possible to every person that deserves to hear it. Great advice. Thank you. John. That's why I'm such a fan of Ayanda's work because he totally gets it. You know, I, I think if you look at what he's done, He's just done something he thought was a cool idea and run with it and look how it's like created uh, something meaningful. There are no rules in this, you know, it's very important to have a content strategy. It's very important to do your research, know who you are and put the pieces together. But it doesn't mean anything if you haven't got your, your core together. You don't know who, who you are, what you're selling, what the thing is. And secondary to that, your um, marketing strategy is a guideline always be willing to pivot, always be willing to try new things. And the more things you try, the more you'll learn. And it really is a trial and error. And, and the one thing social media gives you that is not available anywhere else in, in, in TV and radio is immediate feedback. You can look at analytics and know you've made a mistake or know that some, no one is interested in what you're doing within a second. And it's very hard if you come from a traditional space to listen to that feedback. But if you're always looking at it, then you can only grow. You can only um, improve. You can only make your social following and, and marketing more effective if you're always listening to the feedback that's coming back. Fantastic advice. Absolutely. 
So I'm so sorry that we don't have more time because I know there have been some more questions coming through. Um, we will undertake to answer your questions in writing. Um, I know it's not as much fun as on the webinar, <laughs> but we will get back to you. Um, it's just that we don't have that much more time um, today. Um, if you enjoyed this webinar and you'd like to share it with friends, it will be posted onto our nationalartsfestival.co.za we uh, website. It will go into the artist zone and you'll see there's a section there with a lot of webinars and you can go and look at the other ones as well. And um, we'll also be posting it on social media so you can share with your friends. When we post on to the webinar section of the website, we'll post those links that we promised you as well. Um, and if you are still looking at joining us at the National Arts Festival, the applications to be involved in the Fringe are still open. We are doing a virtual Fringe this year. So it's an open access platform. Anybody who would like to be involved can be. There's no curation, there's no barrier to entry. All you need to do is sign up. There's not even a registration fee. So it's really well worth it. Uh, we'll be providing you with a space where you can showcase your work and you'll be able to actually sell your tickets and um, you'll be under obviously our marketing, uh, but you'll also have links to be able to market your show um, and to promote what you have to offer and not have to worry about all the technical stuff. So. It's a really great um, opportunity for artists to take advantage of. And if you're uncomfortable in the technical space, this is the place to be because, you know, you don't have to do any of the back, back of house stuff. So um, you can also find out about that on our artist zone on the website. Um, and yeah, keep an eye because indeed it is coming up close to the 25th of June, which is when the festival will be launching online. It's going to be lots of fun and I hope to see you all there. And thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. Much appreciated. And thanks again to our wonderful panel and have a great weekend, everyone.